Okay, we are going to get started. Uh, my name is Christine Denny. I'm a co-director of Grand Rounds along with uh, Jeff Miller and uh, Kate Elkington. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have a few announcements and then I'm going to pass over Grand Rounds to Dr. Patrice Malone uh, for a special Grand Rounds today that we are having. So if you are on site tomorrow, July 28th, uh, please remember to stop by the multi-purpose room for our annual ice cream social. It is open to all as long as you have your ID. The ice cream social starts at 1.30 and goes until 3.30. We also have the announcement that the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion developed a survey to gain a better understanding of how NISPI and Columbia Psychiatry employees view equity and diversity in our workplace. This feedback will allow us to further examine our environment and processes related to equity and inclusion. Please take the time to complete the survey. You can find the survey in your inbox. It was sent yesterday from the director's office. Please note that there will be no grand rounds in August. However, we will have a special meeting on August 17th. An announcement will be sent out shortly. Grand rounds will then resume on Wednesday, September 7th, and Dr. Anissa Abidargam will be speaking. The title of her talk is The Pervasive Disruption of Brain Functions by Dopamine and Schizophrenia. For today, um, please note that we encourage everyone to post questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. This is separate from the chat. Um, we would love if you can also add a statement if you would like to ask the question yourself, I prefer to have the question read at the end of your question. We will temporarily promote you to panelists and let you ask your question directly to our speaker. Um, since we have two speakers today, we are gonna hold off to the end to ask questions at the end of both talks. Uh, please also note which speaker you are um, addressing when you put your question into the chat. And so for today, we have the June Jackson Christmas Program Annual Grand Rounds. I am gonna now pass the meeting over to Dr. Patrice Malone for the introductions. And Dr. Malone, thank you for joining us and doing this today. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Denny. Just gonna share my screen. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the annual Dr. June Jackson Christmas Program Grand Rounds. My name again is Dr. Patrice Malone. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and the director of the JJC program. The Dr. June Jackson Christmas Program was started in 2016 when I was a resident in our Department of Psychiatry with the aim of encouraging medical school students from historically underrepresented racial and ethnic groups in medicine to choose a career in psychiatry by exposing them early on in their medical school training to the breadth of what the profession of psychiatry has to offer. The program began with a five week clinical experience during the summer for rising second year medical students. The following year, we expanded to include an eight week research experience for rising second year medical students during the summer for exposure to behavioral health research. And last year, a now recent graduate of our residency program who will join our FPO as an attending next month, Dr. Nicole Pacheco spearheaded a month long sub internship for fourth year medical students from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups in medicine. And Dr. Jade Avery, a current fourth year psychiatry resident, is now leading the fourth year elective as part of her APA SAMHSA fellowship. We are super excited that two prior JJC fellows joined our psychiatry residency program this month. I believe that the overall JJC, that overall the JJC program is in line with Dr. June Jackson Christmas's professional work as she dedicated her career to mental health and advocating for marginalized communities. Dr. Christmas founded the Harlem Rehabilitation Center, an innovative community-based psychiatric program which trained local Harlem residents to assist psychiatric patients who were prior, prior um, inpatients with re-entry into society. She worked as the Commissioner of Mental Health and Mental Retardation Services of New York City 
and later as a member of Governor Mario Cuomo's Advisory Committee on Black Affairs. Dr. Christmas taught at Columbia University and continues to be active in her community at 98 years young. Traditionally, the Dr. June Jackson Christmas Program Grand Rounds has been an event to highlight the change makers in our community that are working to improve access, increase knowledge, and destigmatize mental health illness, especially for historically minoritized populations. I believe that this year's speakers are in line with that effort. Joining us today are Drs. Francois Williams and Lena Green, who will present on community engagement of historically minoritized populations in mental health treatment. Um, I'll just remind you again that you're welcome to use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen to send in questions for the presenters as we will have a question and answer period after both of the speakers present today. Our first presenter is Dr. Francois Williams, who is a current third year psychiatry resident at Baylor College of Medicine. He attended Xavier University of Louisiana for undergrad and received his medical degree from Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Williams participated in the Dr. June Jackson Christmas Clinical Fellowship in 2017. He received an APA SAMHSA Minority Fellowship in 2021 to continue work exploring barbershops as an entry point to engage African-American men in mental health services. Dr. Williams, I will turn it over to you. All right, um, so again, thank you, Dr. Malone for um, inviting me to participate in Grand Rounds. Um, and yeah, let me share my screen. All right, um, so again, my name is Dr. Francois Williams. Um, as Dr. Malone mentioned, I'm a third year psychiatry resident at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and I'm here to, today to talk about the concept of weathering and how it affects black men. Um, I'd like to talk about the black barbershop as a therapeutic landscape, uh, where a place for black men not only come for a haircut, but for relaxation as well. Um, I'd also like to briefly highlight how I've used the barbershop as a clinical entry point to engage African American men and both mental health and hypertension um, initiatives. Um, before I go any further, I do wanna give some special um, thank yous uh, to my mentors. Um, and uh, several of these people uh, for their support and thoughtful contributions to this project, um, especially Dr. Griffith. Um, and I wanna give a special thank you to Antonio Johnson, who. Um, graciously allowed me to utilize his photography of black men um, in barbershop settings. I feel that his work not only highlights the importance of this space, but it also humanizes black men um, in a way that I've personally never seen before. And this is a picture of Wilbert Wilson, um, also known as Mr. Chill, um, an icon and legend in post-Katrina New Orleans. Um, as Dr. Malone did mention, I did go to Xavier University of Louisiana in, in New Orleans. Um, I show this picture because Mr. Chill brought normalcy back to the city as an essential worker um, who instilled hope and uh, he instilled hope one haircut at a time as he cut outside, uh, outside in the heat in a makeshift tent with a gas generator, a pair of clippers, um, on the corner of South Claiborne Avenue and Napoleon Avenue to the people, to the people returning home to the city after the storm. Um, and I wanna dedicate my talk to him. This is one tangible manifestation of his legacy um, and an expression of my appreciation for Mr. Chill and his ability to recreate the barbershop as a therapeutic landscape and the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And this is the barbershop as I knew it um, when I was a student at Xavier. All right, so by the end of this talk, um, you should have a better understanding of how weathering affects both the mental health and physical health of black men. Um, you will have a better understanding of the barbershop as a therapeutic landscape, and you will recognize the barbershop as one of the many community entry points in which black men are being engaged in mental health and physical health initiatives. Um, at the very end, if we have time, I will introduce my future directions, which includes a qualitative research study 
uh, to come that will hopefully provide a foundation uh, as a means of better engaging Black men in mental health care, both in clinical and non-clinical settings. Um, as far as terminology goes, um, I do want to clarify that I use the word Black and African American um, interchangeably uh, during this presentation. Um, and I, I, I do this because whether uh, folks identify as Black or African American, um, there is a shared sense of history, a, a shared sense of identity, struggle, triumph, and community. Um, and irrespective of whether you identify as African American or Black, um, there are issues related to racial prejudices. Um, I also want to talk uh, briefly about some common misconceptions as well. Um, so Black people are not a homogenous group of people, um, and mental health problems of African Americans are not necessarily related to racial identity. Um, so weathering, what, what is weathering? Um, so weathering is the accumulation of cultural, social, and economic disadvantages that leads to earlier deterioration of African Americans compared to their white counterparts through accelerated biological aging. Um, the weathering hypothesis was initially formulated by Dr. Geronimus in 1992. Um, and weathering has been well documented for Blacks here in the United States. Um, weathering speaks to, to allostatic load, uh, which is essentially the overexposure of stress hormones um, and how they can sort of cause wear and tear on important body systems through activation of the sympathetic nervous system, for instance, through the upregulation of the HPA axis. Um, and this sort of wear and tear has uh, disastrous effects on, on uh, the body. For instance, low birth weight, hypertension, abdominal obesity, cardiovascular disease, depression, anxiety, alcohol use, substance use, and binge eating. And I do want to mention that uh, a biopsychosocial formulation of an African-American patient is incomplete when we don't account for the effects of weathering. Um, and in many ways, the weathering is the axis four on the multi-axial system of our patients' lives that can give rise to the axis one, two, and three. Um, and I also wanna share that my conceptualization of weathering grew as I read the most recent Hankerson et al. review in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, and what I was able to sort of put together was that weathering has in common with uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, low back pain, and tennis elbow. Like what, what these things have in common is that um, they're a, a direct result of injury or repetitive insults. Um, and we know that with these particular injuries, the frequency, the severity, the, the duration and timing of, of the weathering are correlated with the severity of mental health outcomes. Um, and we know that weathering affects mental health in at least three ways, um, or, or there's three avenues in which, um, you know, weathering affects mental health. Um, and that is through institutional racism, experiences of discrimination, and the stigma of inferiority. Institutional racism, we know, can lead to, a, to truncated socioeconomic mobility um, and differential access to, to, to desirable resources um, and poor living conditions. Um, and we know that SES is a strong predictor of variations in physical and, and, and mental health. Um, in regards to experiences of discrimination, uh, it's no secret that Blacks here in America experience discrimination in a broad range of contexts in society. Um, these subjective experiences can induce physiological and psychological reactions that can lead to adverse changes in mental health status. And even in the absence of poverty and poor educational opportunities, for middle-class Blacks, there's no immunity to mental illness. At, e at, at each rung of the socioeconomic ladder, Blacks experience discrimination. And in regards to the stigma of inferiority, um, this is sort of pervasive as we continue to accept the negative cultural stereotypes of Blacks through negative images that continue to undermine the importance and very existence of Black people's existence. And the death of George Floyd uh, for all to see was an example of this. Um, this is a snippet from the most recent uh, Hankerson et al. paper that was featured in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, and what I was able to conclude was that weathering is a fundamental driver of the intergenerational transmission of depression. The good thing is, is that the adverse impacts of weathering can be buffered by culturally affirming spaces. 
And for many African-American men, the Black Barbershop is a culturally affirming space that also serves as a therapeutic landscape, right? So for many African-American men, weathering is the problem and therapeutic landscapes is, is one of the solutions. What is a therapeutic landscape? A therapeutic landscape is a place that promotes physical, mental, and spiritual healing and or health and well-being. Um, it's, it's a place where there's healing, restoration, rejuvenation, and relaxation. And this term was first coined by Wilbert Gessler um, as he developed the concept of therapeutic landscapes in the early 90s uh, within the discipline of health geography. Um, and this concept has now been applied to um, various places with lasting reputations for healing. Um, these are three images, uh, a picture of the Roman baths, the Asclepian Sanctuary, um, and the Marian Shrine at Lourdes. Um, and these are sort of the three places that William Gessler initially uh, applied this term to. Um, again, these were places uh, with lasting reputations for healing. Um, and these places still to this day uh, hold an endearing reputation for achieving physical, mental, and spiritual healing. Um, and I do want to mention that this term therapeutic landscape uh, is now finding its way more broadly into psychiatry, as seen in psychiatrist Dr. Ezra Griffith's book entitled Belonging, Therapeutic Landscapes and Networks. So what makes a, a landscape therapeutic? Um, these are some of the elements of therapeutic landscapes as Gessler uh, initially characterized uh, the three places that I showed you before, um, Epidaurus, um, Bath, and Lourdes. Um, and it's important to recognize that each therapeutic landscape will have its own unique set of characteristics. And you'll find that many of these characteristics um, are found in the Black Barbershop. So where do we find these places? Where do we find therapeutic landscapes? Um, so these are several examples of therapeutic landscapes that, that all of us are probably familiar with. Um, so the home landscape um, is a therapeutic landscape, um, sort of finding comfort in the comfort of your own home or in your community. Um, the work and school landscape, um, folks joining professional groups or uh, attending academic conferences, college campuses. Um, you have the sacred landscape, the travel landscape, the hospital landscape, um, uh, for patients, um, sometimes being an inpatient or outpatient settings are therapeutic. Um, and you have the leisure landscape as well, civic groups, fraternities, barbershops, intramural sports, gym memberships. Um, and again, the, the leisure landscape is uh, sort of the umbrella uh, in, in which the, the black barbershop falls under. Um, so why is the black barbershop therapeutic? The Black Barbershop um, is a space for Black people and by Black people, although all are welcome. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it's, a it's a community and dynamic space in which the confluence of Black character um, for and by Black people and small talk establish a context for cultural exchange. And this cultural exchange not only speaks to the monetary currency placed in, into the hands of a barber for a haircut, but it also speaks to the cultural currency exchange through the circulation of information that adds, compounds, and grows to the collective knowledge of the folks in the shop. Um, and you know, there's something special about this place uh, that makes black men wanna come here, um, even on the days when they're not necessarily getting a haircut. Um, in my 2018, 2019 survey, uh, during the time I spent, you know, as a participant observer in the barbershop, we found that 64% of, of men in the, in the survey reported that they came to the barbershop at least twice a month. We found that 46% reported that they came at least once a week, if not more. Um, so, you know, this is a place uh, uh, where, where people find belonging, um, where, where stories uh, reveal strength and resilience. So why does this matter? Um, this matters for, for several reasons. Um, we know that Black men experience weathering both in clinical and non-clinical settings. The hospital is supposed to be a therapeutic landscape, but yet Black men are more likely, to, more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders compared with white men. Um, and Black men are at higher odds of experiencing physical or chemical restraints compared with white patients. Um, 
So weathering within healthcare settings further supports the revealing racial disparities that we see uh, amongst black men in psychiatric care. Um, and we, we know that black men underutilize mental health treatments. We know that black men have the highest all cause mortality rate of any racial or ethnic group here in America. And we know that black men have had a rise in completed suicides um, since, the, since the 1980s. And I just wanna mention that the hospital, the hospital is a therapeutic landscape. Um, and I think that we could all be a little bit more intentional about reducing weathering uh, within black men in the medical setting. Um, so I do wanna spend a little bit of time um, sort of highlighting some of the work that I've been involved in uh, within barbershop settings. Um, and I do wanna to mention that uh, the barbershop has sort of been uh, the, per the perfect place for me to interact with black men across all socioeconomic classes um, and has been a really great place for psychoeducation. Um, so this is a picture of me back in 2016. At the time, I was a medical student at Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, and this is me and brother Latif, um, a barber and community stakeholder in Atlanta, Georgia. In, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I show this picture because Brother Latif was uh, very instrumental in the piloting of the Morehouse School of Medicine, smart and secure children fathering curriculum um, that was done in the barbershop setting. Um, he also created a library within the barbershop that promoted literacy and a love for reading for young black boys um, and utilized this space to host this neighborhood planning unit meetings, um, a city hall initiative which gave different neighborhoods in Atlanta a voice to discuss the utilization of resources within their zoning. Um, and it was sort of through my weekly interactions with Brother Latif that I really became even more involved in uh, mental health and physical health initiatives within the barbershop setting. Um, here is a clip or, or a short clip or video uh, of, of some of the work that I've been engaged in in a barbershop called Fade Away Cuts, um, which is right down the road from University Bar Barbershop where Brother Latif was cutting. Um, Fade Away Cuts is located in Atlanta's West End neighborhood, um, and I volunteered here. Um, during medical school, I joined an organization called Cut Hypertension through Georgia Health Students Taking Action Initiative, um, which was a grassroots organization that focused on the optimizing of the health of Georgians. Um, and it was through this initiative that I found myself checking patrons' blood pressures and providing lifestyle coaching within the, blood, within the barbershop setting. And as a second year medical school student, I did have the opportunity to apply for the APA, the APA Helping Hands grant, um, which allowed me to connect the current blood pressures activities at the time of cut hypertension with a robust mental health campaign that included depression screenings and three mental health forums where psychoeducation was provided. Um, in many ways, we were able to build capacity through mental health literacy. Um, and by decreasing stigma, uh, utilizing the SAMHSA Community Conversation Guide about mental health. Um, I was also able to provide many of the shop goers and barbers with the Mind Matters um, book or resource guide for psychiatry for black communities. Um, and I will say that during this time, uh, the most robust and well-known mental health initiative in the barbershop across the country was the Confess Project led by Lorenzo Lewis in, in late 2015, late early 2016. Um, which at the time was really taking off during when, when, while I was in Atlanta. Um, some of the work that others have done, um, again, includes the Confess Project by Lorenzo Lewis. Um, you have hypertension studies, um, such as the original Cedar sinai barbershop study that was done by the late Dr. Ronald G. Victor. Um, and you have uh, the Cut Hypertension Initiative, which was born out of Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and something that's still being um, done at Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, so the, the gap in the literature. So what we don't know is that, uh, well, what, what we do know is that the barbershop is a therapeutic landscape, um, but we are unclear about the attributes and characteristics that make it therapeutic. Some of my research questions are, what characteristics of the barbershop make it a therapeutic space? What makes these characteristics therapeutic? How does the space maintain well-being? And how does the space help in the day-to-day -day experiences of weathering for Black men? And the aim of, of my future study is to identify the therapeutic attributes 
and the characteristics of the Black barbershop and apply them in clinical settings as a means of better engaging Black men in psychiatric services. Um, as far as my methodology, my proposed methodology, um, I'm interested in using semi-structured interviews, um, participant observation, um, and participatory research methods. I really wanna highlight um, the participatory research piece of, of the method. Um, I think it's really important that I do research with the community and not necessarily on the community. Um, and as a participant obser observer, I plan on immersing myself in the day-to-day -day activities of the barbershop, along with other key stakeholders as a means of understanding how people truly utilize the space. Um, we, will, uh, we will observe what happens in the space. Um, and I think that triangulation is really important as far as mitigating observation bias. Um, so working with other folks within the community, within the setting, I think is important uh, as a means of corroborating and, and converging on the same uh, conclusions as we compare our notes. Um, I know there may be a few folks that are interested in sort of working in the barbershop setting. Um, and I think there's a few things that we ought to consider when sort of coming into the, into the space. Um, it's important to realize that certain individuals and factors may disrupt the interaction uh, within the barbershop setting. Um, oftentimes we can sort of dilute the dynamics of the barbershop. Um, oftentimes folks feel that there's a wide range of relationship dynamics or a power differential. Um, and I even saw that as I came into the barbershop setting sometimes with a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope. Um, I even found that some men may have had some white coat syndrome as I was checking their blood pressure. Um, so it's important to keep this in mind. It's also important to realize that the ethical codes of the barbershop may be different from your own, and it may be different from your institutions. Um, all barbershops are not necessarily priv privy to you coming in with uh, mapping, photography, video recordings. Um, so that's important to keep in mind as well. Um, and again, I really wanna recapitulate this idea that participatory research is key. Um, doing community or doing research with the community and not on the community is really important. And for instance, when we were engaged in our blood pressure um, initiative within the bar barbershop setting, um, we never actually collected data on the blood pressure readings of the men in the shop. The initiative was more about awareness than it, more about awareness than it was um, about studying the folks in the shop. Um, it's also important to realize too that sometimes folks may ask you if they know you're a physician, um, questions that may lie outside of your scope of expertise. Um, sometimes when we were doing our blood pressure work, folks were asking me about diabetes, about prostate cancer, um, when really and truly uh, myself and the volunteers were only trained in all things blood pressure. Um, so some implications. Uh, for Black men, clinical spaces are not necessarily always therapeutic. Um, I think it's important that we as clinicians incorporate weathering into our biopsychosocial formulation of, of our Black patients. Um, I think it's important that we implement attributes of therapeutic landscapes into medical settings, um, inpatient, outpatient, consult services. Um, and I think we ought to strategically utilize therapeutic landscapes that we have access to. Um, not only as a means of self-care for ourselves, um, but for care of those who also occupy these spaces. And I just want to close out by saying, uh, or asking better yet, what attributes and characteristics of therapeutic landscape would you like to see in your clinical practice? Um, and thank you, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Green. Thank you so much for that excellent um, presentation, Dr. Williams. Um, really proud of the work that you are doing and excited that you will continue to go into barbershops and do the work that you started um, with uh, the group looking at hypertension um, in Black males. Um, also really appreciate that you would come back to Columbia as a resident to present here, um, knowing that when you came here before, it was as a JJC clinical fellow. Thank you for your presentation. 
Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lena Green. She is the Executive Director of the Hope Center, a community-based mental health clinic in Harlem. Dr. Green holds both a doctorate and master's degree in social work from NYU and a BA in psychology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She has received numerous awards, including the National Association of Social Workers Impact Award, and was recently inducted into the Phi Alpha Social Work Honor Society. Dr. Green, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Malone. I hope that everyone can hear me clearly. Um, I also want to say just thank you so much for, for having me today, giving me an opportunity to present. Um, thank you, Dr. Williams, for such a great presentation. And I look forward to sharing this work with you all and hope that uh, you all will learn more about the Hope Center and the work that we do here. Give me one second. I'm just making sure that I have all of my things up and ready to go. Okay. Um, so as uh, Dr. Malone shared, I'm Dr. Lena Green. I am the executive director of the Hope Center Harlem, uh, which is located in the heart of Harlem on West 116th Street. We are connected also to First Corinthian Baptist Church, and you'll hear a little bit more about that as well. Um, I typically do this presentation in partnership um, with my colleague um, and partner in community engagement, Dr. Sidney Hankerson, which some of you may know well. Um, he previously worked at Columbia Presby. Uh, he is now currently the vice chair of psychiatry at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, he also has an expertise uh, in NIH, NIH funded uh, research, as well as church-based mental health services and community engagement. Um, so we have I, ideally um, been working together for over 10 years. And so my work here um, coming from uh, city service and city government in 20 years and coming to the Hope Center to work um, has really been a pleasure and an exciting endeavor that we have embarked on together. Um, so today uh, we're gonna be talking um, ideally in three areas. Um, so initially, first starting with Dr. Hankerson's work um, and his research around racial disparities in dis depression care. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about rationale for church-based care. And then I'm going to probably spend the bulk of the time talking to you all about the Hope Center model of care, what we do here, and how we work together in the community. So most of you know, uh, preaching to the choir here, right, that uh, depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide. And so when we're looking at um, African Americans um, with depression, we uh, have found that they are actually more impaired than their white counterparts. Um, that includes in areas of work, in relationships, um, in social settings, and just overall. Um, we also know too from our work that um, they are uh, African Americans uh, are more likely to present with somatic symptoms. Um, they're more concerned about stigma. They're less likely to have access to comprehensive medical care. Um, and um, they are uh, less likely to engage um, in, in, uh, the in, in, in hospital based uh, or clinic based settings of care. Of care. Excuse me. So this is just a quick slide um, on some disparities as it relates to um, treatment and processes of depression. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, disparities in uh, depression care. So in the research, it uh, was found that clergy actually provide more depression care counseling than physicians overall. Um, so this is a slide that sort of goes through uh, where folks are mo more likely to receive depression care. So obviously overall from uh, mental health professionals. Then second to that is clergy. 
a third are general MDs, and then uh, the fourth bar here is with regard to psychiatrists. Okay. Um, okay. So as it relates to the African American population, um, we found that uh, African Americans are the most religious group in the U.S. Uh, 87% of African Americans belong to a, a religious group um, across the board. 79% of African Americans say that, or Black or African Americans uh, say that religion is very important in their lives. And 53% attend uh, a church service at least once per week. Um, and again, that's not focused on any particular denomination. And again, those religious affiliations um, and church experiences are across the board, regardless of religious denomination. Right. Um, and so with that, we wanna understand that there's a role for the church in providing several things, um, providing social services, uh, promoting uh, health overall, um, and then also giving us an opportunity to uh, reach broad populations. Um, and some of the research that we have engaged in with regard to um, church-based populations have included um, just uh, screening of depression for, uh, for Black men, as well as uh, screening for grief, um, which we've done um, with one of our partners, uh, specifically around complicated grief. And I can share more about that if anyone has any more questions. Okay. So um, Dr. Hankerson's work really looked at um, establishing the fe feasibility of uh, church-based care. Um, and so he engaged in uh, focus groups with 21 clergy um, at three different churches. And 50% of the respondents were women, identified as women, 87% uh, had a master's degree or higher. And these were churches with over 20,000 members um, affiliations in attendance. Um, and this was primarily focused on the, uh, what we call AME denomination, which stands for African Methodist Episcopal. So some of the, the focus group findings um, that came out of Dr. Hankerson's work uh, were really um, the feedback from the, 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 the folks um, that were engaged in the survey. And that is that, you know, the effects of slavery um, were focused on white supremacy and institutionalized racism and all the things that we talk about in the black community that can cause depression. These are some of the concerns. They were concerned about uh, being partners uh, and engaging with the work. So uh, one quote says that, you know, there has to be partners within, so it's not like outsiders coming in and using us as guinea pigs. Um, and we know that uh, historically, um, many communities of color, particularly the African-American community has um, engaged in, uh, you know, uh, experimental practices within that group in that community. And so there's still a lot of mistrust that happens. Um, and so these were some concerns that they had. So um, amongst the church-based uh, depression screening, um, folks were screened using the PHP-9 um, and there were 122 participants, 44% uh, uh, were men and the average age of the participants uh, was age 54. Okay. Um, and so we see here that um, the church members with a positive depression screen um, for men was 23%, uh, which is pretty uh, highly uh, statistically significant. Um, and so um, it, we wanted to focus on making sure that um, we engage in participatory research um, so we wanted to essentially make sure that we are um, increasing the participation of the folks that we are working with um, and that we're not just doing research on them, that we are do doing research with them. We uh, wanted to make sure that we increase our trust, increase our, our capacity, um, as well as increase the disparities um, specifically around care and access to care. Okay. 
Um, so now I'm going to uh, take you all um, on a little bit of a journey to really just talk a little bit more about the Hope Center model of care and what we do here. Um, so uh, Hope for us stands for Healing on Purpose and Evolving. Um, so this is actually a, a picture um, from our uh, annual uh, Hope Center Focus Survey um, that really allows us uh, to focus on, focus the conversation on mental health during our church worship services. Um, so um, it's, uh, we are considered uh, the, the first um, of its kind mental health center that is connected again to a church, uh, specifically a Baptist church. So we are connected to FCBC, which stands for First Corinthian Baptist Church. I'm going to show you this clip. And I'm gonna ask that you all bear with me for one second because I want to make sure that uh, I minimize the technical difficulties as it relates to this. So let's hope that this part goes well. Okay, hold on. Uh, Dr. Malone, can you just please let me know our assignment if you, you can, can press escape. Hear? Press escape, okay. Okay. Sorry about that, Simon. I am doing that. Yep. Um, um, just click on the uh, PowerPoint presentation and press escape, and then you can see your uh, share or new share option. Okay. Sorry. It may be on your second window. Yeah, I'm trying to see if that works. I'm not sure if that worked. Let me still seeing your slide. My car. Say that once more. We're still seeing your slide. So do new share. Okay. New share. And then the uh, the browser. Okay. Let's see. Let's With see. the video. Yep. Let me see if that works. Perfect. Just does that work? I went yep. to the a full screen now. The emergency awesome. room, come to find out, I had some issues. My mother recommended Sorry about the that commercial. I go to Kobe and Myers. They just took it from there. Like many large active churches, First Corinthian Baptist has an excellent music ministry and it has a well respected pastor. God sets before you a vision of possibility. He's known for his casual style, but that's not the only unorthodox thing about Reverend Michael Walrund. I went and found an amazing therapist that really nurtured me to a place of wholeness. But and he's talking about the psychotherapy he receives in his sermons. If I began to speak about it freely, it would liberate others to talk about it. I'll never forget it. Uh, Miss Betty Davis came up to me after the presentation and said, you have to meet my pastor because he talks from the pulpit about the importance of mental health. Psychiatrist Dr. Sidney Hankerson was invited by Reverend Walrund to start mental health programs at First Corinthian Baptist designed to stop historical inaccuracies and atrocities in black communities. There's a tremendous amount of distrust that is rightly deserved in the black community as it relates to seeking mental health care. Early American psychiatrists like John Galt wrote that Blacks are immune to mental illness because they couldn't own property or fully participate in society. And pre-Civil War experts said that fleeing enslavement was a mental illness treatable by whipping anyone who tried to escape. We know that racial trauma is real. Dr. Lena Green says that narrative is why Pastor Walrand and Dr. Hankerson created the center that she now runs. To help people back away from the stigma and the shame around feeling like I'm crazy or I'm not doing well. The whole center stands for healing on purpose and evolving. It wasn't just for members of the church. Anyone can benefit from the programming here. We offer 10 sessions uh, free of charge so no one ever has to worry about finances or insurance as a barrier to getting treatment and care. They also have a program called Mental Health First Aid 
that trains regular folks to assist people with mental health challenges. After doing the training, one of the community members, who's a member of the church, came up to me in tears and she said, Dr. Hankerson, thank you so much for this. My granddaughter is 17 years old and she was recently diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I thought before this training today, I thought that she just was being a bad person. Just like the Hope Center, Dr. Hankerson is based uptown here at Mount Sinai, which is right across the street from one of the city's largest areas of public housing. How do we engage people in barbershops and beauty salons into mental health care? One of my dreams is to replicate the Hope Center in every major city in the United States. James Ford, PIX11 News. 9-11 didn't end on 9-11. So hopefully I'm back. I <laughs> uh, just want to make sure that you all can see. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I want to share a little bit. Um, you heard a, a small bit um, from Pastor. Mr. Mike, who is our, our, uh, our person um, in this short video clip, but I want to share a little bit more about the history of how the FCBC uh, Counseling Center, um, the Hope Center came to be. Um, so we initially started um, with an introduction uh, to church-based counseling services. And so we had, uh, initially started having mental health conversations from the pulpit. Um, and so while you may not think that that's a big deal, um, it actually is uh, a pretty unique thing um, because most of the time um, houses of worship across the board are not engaging in conversations around mental health. Um, and so our pastor um, was very transparent about his battles, his own battles with depression and anxiety. Um, And so our in-house services began with one clinician on site at the House of Worship. Um, it was available to all members of the con congregation at no cost. Um, there was an increase in need, of course, um, and there were concerns about stigma and, of course, uh, client requests for privacy. Um, and so with that, um, we established the Hope Center um, on December 15th of 2016. And the Hope Center's mission is to provide quality therapeutic services to the Harlem community and beyond, um, and to directly impact the mental health needs and promote health and wellness. Um, our vision overall uh, is to empower and support our community in the process of creating and sustaining lifelong wellness. Um, I'm gonna get in a little bit more about our language and some of the things that are unique to us, um, but I wanted to make sure that I shared with you all um, about our staff diversity. Um, so obviously, uh, Dr. Hankerson is a psychiatrist who's part of our team here. Um, I am a clinical social worker as well. Uh, we have a clinical psychologist on staff. Um, part of our staff is also our ministers and our deacons who are all trained in mental health first aid. They're also trained um, in trauma. We also have uh, mental health coaches on staff. Um, we have, we'll be, we will be beginning um, our psychiatry uh, residence rotation um, in partnership with the APA Foundation uh, beginning this year. And then we'll also be uh, having a rotation of a, a fourth year uh, psychiatry residence from Mount Sinai uh, beginning in October of this year as well. We have a host of clinical interns um, and our clinical interns are mostly social workers who come um, from our partnering schools, uh, so mostly Columbia and NYU. Um, and then we also have a, a, a few clinical interns um, that are getting a, a master's um, in mental health counseling that come from Manhattan College and other universities uh, across the city. Um, and then we also have um, several public health students who work with us throughout the year that come to us from the Keeney School of Public Health that is right here located in, in Harlem on West 125th Street. So one of the ways that we um, really get at stigma is really around our language. Um, so here we do not use the term patient. We don't use the word client and we don't use the word victim or sufferer. We use the term innovator. And um, we ask, you know, who is an innovator or what is an innovator? 
and it is one who makes healing a lifestyle. Um, also here, we um, you know, courageously engage um, around pain points for um, our current narrative, really to help folks transform their wounds into wellness. Um, and so we don't uh, use terms like treatment plan that would traditionally uh, be used in clinical settings. Uh, we use terms like wellness journey. Um, so those are just some of the ways in which we engage um, and try to come away from so more medicalized terms that may be intimidating or off-putting to our population. Uh, so some of the services that we um, offer here at the Hope Center include individual and family counseling. Uh, we provide group-based services, which I'll share a, a few more, a uh, few of those slides in a moment. Um, we have an array of wellness-based initiatives. Uh, here, um, for our model, we offer 10 free sessions of evidence-based care. Um, so that is in CBT, IPT, um, SFBT, Solution Focused Brief Therapy, as well. Um, our innovators um, slash clients do not have to be members um, of our church. They don't have to be members of First Corinthian. They don't have to um, be a person of faith uh, to engage or receive services, and neither do the clinicians who work here. Um, and then if folks are interested um, in longer uh, treatment um, or are in need of um, longer-based treatment needs, we uh, refer out to various programs. Um, we also engage, engage quite heavily in virtual programming, especially during the pandemic. Um, and so we've led mindfulness and meditation uh, virtually as well as sound baths. We do something called virtual check-ins where it's just really folks coming in and sharing a positive message or affirmations for the day. And we've done that on a weekly basis. Excuse me, we also have what we call our healing conversations where we invite um, experts um, in their field to really come and have a conversation with us around something in particular. So we've had um, conversations focused on suicide, uh, navigating depression and anxiety, as well as grief and loss to name a few. Um, and then we have an array of community-based events, um, some of which are coming up uh, where we engage the community in free services outside. Um, and because we are also connected to a food pantry, uh, we also ensure that um, we are mindful of folks who are food insecure and ensure that we can engage them and provide some con uh, provide for them in some concrete ways as well. Uh, so the most common presenting problems uh, that folks request services for include depression, anxiety, trauma, and grief and loss, which you can imagine during the pandemic um, was uh, a great need um, and continues to remain so. Um, our client demographics uh, range in uh, age between, uh, our innovators range in age between the ages of 16 to 76. 90% uh, of the innovators that we serve identify as black. Uh, 85, uh, uh, excuse me, 85% identify as women and 30% identify as part of the LGBTQ population. So just a quick look at our impact um, for 2021. Um, so for direct clinical care, we provided over 60,000 minutes of evidence-based treatment. Um, we have on average 40 to 50 clinical sessions a week. Um, and we engage um, 240 plus conversations on our crisis text line. So we have um, our own word um, that is connected to the, to the crisis text line, which is worthy um, that belongs to the Hope Center so that we can track how many people are using um, the services that we offer and provide here. And anyone can text the word worthy to 741741 and get connected to free 24 seven confidential care. With regard to our workshops and seminars, um, we've served uh, over 20,000 people um, with, with regard to the views that we've had on, on, our, on our events and workshops. Um, we delivered over 25 workshops um, in person and virtually each year. Um, and we've had over uh, 4,000 attendees um, at our community events as well. Um, we're excited uh, that last year uh, we were able to go international. Um, and so we've had participant, participants from uh, not only just the US, but also folks joined us from Germany, France, London, and Ireland. Um, so one of the things that we do well here um, at the Hope Center is really engage our partners. Um, so this is just an, uh, an example of that. Uh, this is Dan Gillison, who's the head of NAMI. Um, and so we invited uh, 
Dan, we invited Raul, who's also the head of the APA Foundation currently, um, as well as a host of mental health clinicians, um, storytellers, and poets um, to come and join us to talk about the power of our stories and why this is an important thing to share. Um, and it was focused on mental health. And so many of the folks that joined us shared their mental health story and why mental health is important to them and the ways in which they engage um, the mental health system. Um, these are just some um, examples of the kinds of workshops that we provide here at the Hope Center. Um, so unmasking masculinity, um, the pride room that was focused on um, uh, young adults uh, who identify as LGBTQ. We have a writing for wellness therapeutic uh, writing workshop. And of course, at the bottom is our healing conversation um, featuring myself, as well as a couple of folks, um, Dr. Hankerson, uh, Dr. Michael McCray, um, who's at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Dr. Michael Lindsay, who is currently the uh, new dean uh, for the NYU School of Social Work. Um, I wanted to share quickly um, just some of the population-based initiatives that we offer here at the Hope Center. Um, so Thrive um, focuses on uh, a, a teen suicide prevention, and so we call Thrive our Youth Resilience Program. Um, that focuses on uh, suicide pre prevention specifically for Black and Latinx youth um, in middle school and high school. Uh, we also engage the arts. And so we have a partner in the Josephine Herrick Project where we invite um, folks to join us for a 10 week photography session to focus on um, sharing their view and their lens around what wellness is using uh, photography. Um, and then we host what we call in the den conversations every few months that specifically focus on engaging men um, around conversations related to mental health. Um, and we do that in uh, non-traditional spaces. So our first ever in the den conversation was actually held in a cigar bar um, and we had over 40 attendees. Um, so we're super excited to just share some of the work that we do here um, in, in untraditional ways and in non-traditional spaces. Um, wellness is really part of everything that we do. Um, and so this is just an example of how we message hope, how we message mental health, and how we message wellness. Um, so these are the ways in which we do that with our gear, which is for sale, um, because we want people to be um, proud um, about healing on purpose and evolving, uh, focusing, uh, focusing on the mental health and focusing on the wellness. Um, so just quickly, um, as I wrap up in these last few minutes, um, just to talk a little bit about, again, our overall goals and our motto for the Hope Center. So our goals are really to deliver culturally sensitive care in a trusted setting, um, again, being connected to a church. Um, we want to be able to equip uh, clinicians to use the faith model of community engagement, which I'll share in a moment. Um, and we also want to be able to increase access to mental health services um, and promote equity. Um, this is the way in which we equip our clinicians in the faith-based faith model, excuse me, of community engagement. And that is by forming a strong partnership by assessing the community's needs, by identifying leaders who will support. Um, and we also talk, um, consider them our credible messengers. We wanna take time to set the context. And we also wanna make sure that we are honoring the community's culture. Um, and so these are just some of the partnerships um, that we have here um, through our partnerships uh, across the city. So that again, include Mount Sinai, um, NYU School of Social Work, Columbia School of Social Work, and First Corinthian. Baptist Church. Okay, um, and so I'll conclude here. Um, in summary, to share that you know churches are ideally suited to promote mental health equity. Community partnered engagement um, helps foster and expand uh, a novel church academic partnership. Um, and partnering uh, with community based participatory research um, will help or has helped, excuse me, to build the Hope Center's research capacity. So thank you. I will turn it back over to Dr. Malone. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, um, for that wonderful, just excellent presentation. It was very informative. And thank you for the work that you do in our community. I'll ask um, both Dr. Green and Dr. Williams to, to come back and we'll start the question and answer period. We have a number of questions that have come in and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I'll ask, I'll maybe ask uh, one or two at first and then maybe we can bring one of the attendees, the audience members um, 
into the webinar so they can actually ask their question directly to you all. I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Ralph Wharton. Um, uh, he has a question about, first of all, there, there was a bit of a comment about um, that um, he was surprised that um, Dr. Williams did not mention church as a therapeutic landscape. And I'm sure, uh, Ralph, now you can kind of see why, because uh, Dr. Green was going to speak extensively about that. So then I'll ask um, the next question that Ralph- Can I add something to that? Sorry oh, to cut you off, Dr. Yes, Malone. Yeah, so the, uh, the, 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 the church as a therapeutic landscape falls under the sacred landscape umbrella. I, sh I should have made that more clear, but houses of worship um, fall under that, that umbrella, right? So there's the home landscape, the work and school landscape, the sacred landscape, the travel landscape, the hospital landscape, and the leisure landscape. So just want to make that clear. Thank you. No, thank you for clarifying there, um, because you certainly listed the sacred um, spaces or landscapes, and so thank you for providing some clarification. Um, so then there's, um, Dr. Wharton has a question about um, therapeutic spaces for women, in particular, I'll say um, um, hair salons. And have hair salons been used similarly to barbershops for men? Um, barbershops obviously have been used. And so with women, how about hair salons for Black women? I, I think that there's a lot of untapped potential that lies uh, within the Black uh, hair salon space. Um, I really haven't uh, explored that space as that's not the therapeutic landscape that I personally um, occupy. Um, I, I find that it's a lot easier uh, for me to sort of do work in the therapeutic landscapes that I occupy than it is to sort of um, explore other landscapes. But I do think that um, there is a lot of potential in black hair salons, um, black nail salons, um, spas, um, as, as places where we can really engage um, women across all races um, and, and mental health initiatives. and. Uh, sort of shrink the stigma that lies around mental health. Thank you for that, Dr. Dr. Williams. I think we're going to actually bring one of the audience members. Um, we're going to spotlight them and have them ask ask a question. We have Dr. Harris here now. So, Alex, take it away. Thank you. So this question is for Dr. Williams. Um, and first, I want to just uh, say how blown away I am by the exciting and powerful work that you're doing. Um, it's just uh, astonishingly beautiful. And um, I guess what I want to ask you is if you could speak to the, um, the way that you'll measure success as you proceed with your work, like what sort of outcomes will you use? How will you know when it's working? And, and what will you you know, how do you see the, the future of this sort of unfolding? Got you. Um, thank you for your warm words. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure. This is something that I'm gonna have to run by my mentor, Dr. Griffith. Um, she's sort of, uh, not sort of, she is a, an expert in, in qualitative research methods. Um, a lot of my background um, has been more so quantitative, um, but it's something for us to explore. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you have any recommendations or if anybody else has any recommendations as to how we can sort of measure um, some of these qualitative things, but um, that's one of the things that we're still uh, sort of figuring out. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna focus on one of the trainee questions. We love to get those um, and then we'll get back uh, to the, the list that's come in and of questions. And so um, the trainee question is about really how um, one might, a trainee in particular, might um, do a rotation at the Hope Center, Dr. Green, um, and what that might entail, what it would look like, um, and just how could a Columbia psychiatry resident in particular get involved in your work? Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, so first, you can certainly uh, reach out to me. I'll make sure that um, Dr. Malone is able to share our contact information. 
Um, we are certainly open to having a fellow here. We actually had a fellow in the past from Columbia. Dr. Green, you've muted yourself, so we don't hear you now. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, I was saying we have actually had um, psychiatry residents in the past year through the APA Foundation, um, who was under the supervision of Dr. Hankerson. Uh, Dr. Angela Coombs uh, came to us from Columbia uh, previously in previous years. Um, and so we're certainly open to that. Um, it would just, I can certainly work, work with um, the staff there to see how we could open up um, availability to uh, for a rotation here um, at the Hope Center. Um, and so uh, Dr. Malone, if you would be so kind as to share my information, um, we can certainly work on that. And then we also have supervision in place um, with uh, Dr. Hankerson for uh, psychiatry residents as well. Yes, happy to pass on your contact information and appreciate your generosity, Dr. Green, to have trainees come to the Hope Center. So I'm sure that would be a wonderful experience for them. Um, gonna go to the next question. This is actually a question for Dr. Williams. Do you think that the landscape of barbershops can facilitate efforts to focus on the mental health consequences of racial trauma, such as PTSD, depression, and prolonged grief? Absolutely, and I, I think that a lot of the work that um, Lorenzo Lewis is now doing with the Confess Project, um, across the country really focuses on um, this idea of like narrative therapy um, as a means of sort of coping with PTSD, depression, um, as well as uh, solutions-based uh, brief uh, therapies in the, in the barbershop setting as well, um, solution-focused brief therapy. Um, so there are uh, initiatives um, that are still sort of building capacity around uh, these very things that you're asking about. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. We have uh, Dr. Ezra Susser who has joined us to ask a question. So if you're okay, Ezra, it's, you can take it away next. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, those are both outstanding presentations, especially to get so much across in 30 minutes each. That was wonderful. Um, my question's for um, Dr. Williams. I, you know, I've seen a few clinics um, that have tried to create therapeutic spaces, you know, somewhat equivalent to what you have in the barbershop. But I, I've never seen this in a hospital. And I was wondering, and I think it should be done in hospitals, but I don't know of any example. And I wonder if you know of any example or have any thoughts about it. Absolutely, thank you for your question. So um, I'm based here in Houston, Texas. Um, and at the Michael E. Uh, DeBakey VA Hospital, there's actually a barbershop in the hospital. Um, there's a gentleman who shines shoes in the barber or in the hospital. Um, there at the hospital, um, at least pre-COVID, you would find men um, playing chess um, and sort of hanging out. Um, so the hospital space was sort of a milieu or a therapeutic landscape for many of the veterans who sort of occupied this space. Um, honestly, I haven't been able to really uh, work within the barbershop setting at the at the Michael E. DeBakey Hospital. Um, simply because the space is just so small um, and the hours are, are oftentimes limited. Um, but I think there's a lot of untapped potential with this idea of, of sort of implementing uh, barbershops within, within, hospital, um, within hospital settings. Does, does the, um, just as a follow-up, does that hospital provide institutional support for the use of the barbershop that way? Um, you know, I'm honestly not sure, um, but when I did receive the APA SAMHSA Minority Fellowship Award, um, uh, that was actually the first place that I was trying to, uh, I was trying to do my work in, in the VA hospital, um, but just due to COVID protocols, it, it didn't really pan out. Um, but uh, as far as I knew, the, the leadership was very supportive of uh, the initiatives that I've been doing in, in community uh, barbershop settings. but. Um, I don't see why the, the VA um, system wouldn't sort of support a uh, mental health initiative in the barbershop that exists within um, hospital settings. And I do want to mention too that um, Texas Children's here uh, in Houston, Texas, as well as um, MD, MD Anderson Cancer Center um, has, has barbershops um, as well. So I think it's something that we ought to uh, sort of explore together. Yeah, maybe here too. Thank you. 
we have a question from Dr. Janice Cutler. Um, so she's just uh, observing that um, with your work, Dr. Green, that it seems like men are not participating at the same rate as women, despite there being higher rates of depression. And any thoughts about why that is and how to address that? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so men traditionally have not engaged in mental health care at, at the same rate as women. Um, and so lucky for uh, me, um, I have actually a background in engaging men in mental health care, particularly during um, the perinatal period. So some of my research has focused on that as well. Um, and so we're, we're actually in the process of creating spaces um, specifically to engage men. Um, so hence the creation of In the Den, uh, where we can focus on having conversations that focus on mental health, um, ways of coping, managing stress um, that are really outside of the Hope Center and actually outside of the church. So we've been able to engage, as I shared before, um, hosting uh, a men's only um, uh, talk uh, focused on mental health, um, education, psychoeducation, and managing stress at a cigar bar. Um, we're looking to do that um, at uh, a community center um, and just looking for other ways in which folks can gather um, that are not necessarily, uh, you know, based in, in the clinic itself. Um, so those, those have been quite successful. Um, we also are in the process of uh, creating space specifically targeting uh, dads, um, which is some of the work that I've also done in the past that will also you know, make room for having those conversations around um, mental health. Thanks for that information, Dr. Green. Um, uh, we have, a, have actually a kind of two-part question. There, there are two different uh, questions from the same person. Dr. Green, where or how do you get your funding? And how do you manage innovators who also have substance use issues? So two separate questions. Um, so our funding, we get in a variety of ways. We actually don't have um, any government-based funding. Um, and so interestingly enough, um, we've been the recipients of uh, multi-year funding grants that have come from private foundations and philanthropists. Um, and then we also um, rely quite heavily um, on the giving of, of our church members. Um, and so this has been initially uh, fully funded by just church giving. Um, the Hope Center itself receives a grant from the church side, but um, on a weekly basis, uh, we have recurrent giving opportunities where we engage the congregation at large. Um, and again, we've applied for other, other grants um, that we've been the recipients of. Um, but we don't have any um, government funding at all whatsoever. Um, and then remind me of the second part of the question. Yes, I will. <laughs> uh, the second question was, how do you manage innovators who also have substance use issues? Okay, yes. Um, so we do have um, some of our, our, our clinicians who are focused on substance abuse treatment. So we do provide some substance abuse treatment here. We certainly screen for it here at the Hope Center. Um, and then we make referrals. So, you know, one of our strong suits is really working and engaging with our partners. Um, so we, some, we do have some hospital-based partners and then we also have some uh, community, smaller community-based organizations that focus on substance abuse as well that we refer to. I'm, I, I have a bit of a, a question myself and wondered if, if um, both of you could answer this from your point of view based on the therapeutic landscape that you occupy. Um, and that's a, if you could provide us a bit of historical context about how come churches or barbershops are places that are considered safe for uh, Black folks, um, where they come frequently and uh, even um, uh, Dr. Williams, as you said, sometimes not even getting a haircut, but still showing up. I, I partly ask that because I think the context is really important. And it, it seems that, um, for instance, with chur the church, with Black people, especially those who come from a history of um, their ancestors being enslaved, that that was a particular place where it was acceptable, for instance, to gather. There were places that 
as enslaved folks, um, they were not permitted to gather in, in groups. Um, and so I just wonder if both of you could provide a little bit a more context or historical context around why these two spaces um, are um, historically important for Black people. You want to go first or would you like to go first? You can go first, Dr. Green. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so Dr. Malone, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, right, um, to talk a little bit about um, just even dating back um, to uh, slavery times, right? We, uh, Black folks really had very few spaces where they could gather and gather freely. Um, and so the, the church has always been uh, a, a space or a safe haven uh, for Black people, right? So whether it was focusing on politics, whether it was you know focusing on religion, whether it was focusing on um, health-related issues, um, it's always been a, a safe place where folks could go to gather, to get information, um, and to navigate um, really dangerous uh, territory, right? Um, and so there was a sense of protection that has offer, always been offered in the church, um, a sense of comfortability, um, and, a, and, a, and a place where folks can build community, right? One of the things that we found out during the pandemic, um, interestingly enough, was that, um, you know, we also had higher rates of depression um, and, and requests for services um, via the Hope Center, um, but folks were really missing out on that social engagement. Um, that the church space actually offers, right? And getting information. Um, and our church in particularly um, is very active in the community. Um, and so not only do we offer uh, mental health services, we, off we also offer services around the arts and education. We also offer, offer services um, around financial education. And we also have a food pantry, right? And so the church has always been a place that has provided for the holistic needs of, of folks, um, particularly uh, black folks and, and, and folks of color across the board. Um. Yeah, Dr. Malone, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, and it, it really made me think about uh, Quincy T, Dr. Quincy T. Mill's book, um, Cutting Across the Color Line, um, where he talks about the rich history um, behind the Black Barbershop. But um, I mean, the barbershop has just always been the safe space um, that has historically lied behind a veil in which, uh, it, I mean, it's been a space where black men would come um, where they felt comfortable, where they were free to, they were able to speak freely. Um, and as, a, as an adolescent, it was a place at age 14 and 15 where I would go um, and where I was able to find my voice. Um, I was able to socialize with um, folks like Deion Sanders, Michael Irving, um, and although they were seen as celebrities um, sort of outside of the barbershop setting, um, everybody was sort of on an equal playing field. Um, and I thought that sort of banter and engagement, um, I don't know, there's just something about it that's uh, very special for Black men. It, it sounds like it's a, a space where people could truly be themselves. Um, so that, that's, it's nice to have some of that historical context. I'm, I'm going to um, wrap up a little bit and then uh, Dr. Blair Simpson is going to join us and give some um, remarks. So I, I just want to say that, you know, I so appreciate the speakers um, and thank you so much for these really wonderful presentations and the work that you're doing to advocate for marginalized communities. And from the JJC team, we would just like to thank all of you who support the JJC program from the clinical service chiefs and their teams, um, research groups, mentors, and also the Leon Levy Foundation, NIMH, and the APA for um, financial support. So I will turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Blair Simpson, our interim chair. Hi, Lena and Francois. Thank you so much for those beautiful talks and the incredible work that you're doing. You know, we we sit in the um, Department of Psychiatry in the New York State Psychiatric Institute, and we have these three missions, right? Education, training, clinical, and research. And, you know, a huge part of what we do is research, like 50% of our budget is research. But if the research doesn't go anywhere, like the research is all to find mechanism and new treatments, but if it doesn't actually get to people, then what are we doing? Right. And what I love about your talks is it's beyond just to our clinics get to people. It's actually how do we get to our communities 
and the way you talk about how we have to all think outside the box if we want to get to all of our communities, right? Um, and really address the mental health disparities that we've seen and know. So I love this notion of therapeutic landscapes or communities and be it barber shops or churches. You know, I know people in our department have worked in schools and other go into the community of the school to actually think about engaging people in, you know, early and engaging their families. Um, obviously you can go into their workplaces. So you, you actually get me to start thinking about our workplace, right? And what is our community like? for advancing the mental health of our workers, right? And then that dovetails with a big initiative we've been working on the last couple of months, which is well-being. How do we actually um, help? Could, when people come to our workplace, do they find our workplace to be a therapeutic community, not just not only for our patients, but what about for us, <laughs> right? And so... Um, we've got a long ways to go, but it's something that we're thinking about here. And I think that your talk so beautifully, not only the work that you do in the communities where it matters, but also the reflection back to, could we all, could, I mean, imagine if our world was all a therapeutic community. You know, everywhere we went or many places we went, it didn't, it wasn't only the church, but it was also the school. It was also the workplace. Imagine what it would feel like or be like. And maybe that's too idealistic a dream, but that's what you get me to think about. And I love this notion of innovators and, you know, are, could we all be innovators in helping making healing a lifestyle? So beautiful work that you're doing in your communities, but also um, reflects back, if you will, from my point of view to our community here and efforts we need to make here at home as well. Thank you for those thoughtful words, Dr. Simpson. Um, I just want to make sure that before we wrap up, if Dr. Green or Dr. Williams have any final words um, before we come to a close. I just want to say, Dr. Malone, thank you for having me. Columbia, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Dr. Malone, for putting together the uh, JJC program. Um, it, it really affirmed my interest um, in psychiatry. Um, and thank you to the APA Foundation um, for supporting uh, the work that I do. I echo those sentiments. So thank you so much, Dr. Malone. Thank you, Dr. Simpson. Um, I want to um, extend an invitation to anyone uh, who may be joining us today to come visit us over at the Hope Center. Um, we, we love to engage in community. We'd love to have you here, come and visit us. Um, and again, thank you for giving us an opportunity to really share the work that we do. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both again um, for just these powerful talks and the messages that you brought mm -hmm. and Dr. Simpson for your commitment to mm -hmm. um, really figuring out how our department can be a therapeutic landscape for um, staff, faculty, and patients. Um, and trainees. Um, so I just want to say, you know, wishing everyone a happy and healthy day. And we will see you next year for another installment for the JJC Grand Round. Bye, Bye everyone.